some of you may know or have heard of um, Paul Butler, who is the director and information of um, information and library services at uh, the University of Greenwich. Paul has asked two of his stars to share with us today about the digital strategy at the University of Greenwich, which Paul was instrumental in. So I've got great pleasure in introducing Mehmet Batmez, Head of Infrastructure, and Raina Lloyd, Head of the PMO. They're going to share with us how they developed and gave approval, gained approval for their digital strategy and their approach for how it will be implemented. So, Mehmet and Raina, over to you. Okay, can you hear me? Is that, is that good? Yeah. I don't know which mic I'm coming out from here. So, <laughs> um, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, I'm Memo Batmaz. I'm head of infrastructure at the University of Greenwich. Um, I've been with the university for uh, a little over 11, 12 years now, uh, and in my current role is head of infrastructure for three years. Um, and Raina Lloyd is. Yeah, so I head up the um, program management office um, in the University of Greenwich, and as I said, we're here to talk a about our development of the uh, digital strategy. But before we talk about that, Mehmet's just going to give a little bit of background about the university itself. Okay, so um, the University of Greenwich was established in 1890, uh, which means we're in the business of education for a little over 125 years. Um, we have over 38,000 registered students worldwide. Um, 18,000 of those students study wholly overseas through our t and &E partnerships, uh, and 20,000 of those students study here in the UK. 20% um, of those UK students uh, are actually from outside of the UK, so we're a, we're a cosmopolitan university. Um, very proud to be awarded the silver rating for the Teaching Excellence Framework, um, and we're rated first class by the People and Planet, Planet University League. Um, and we have a 79% student satisfaction rating on the NSS. So, um, the University of Greenwich is a three campus university. Um, Greenwich is the largest of our three campuses and it's a, it's a World Heritage site, so a really beautiful site. It's where I work, Rainer works, and actually the rest of ILS. Um, it sits just off the bank of the River Thames, um, at the heart of Greenwich, and it's centred on three Baroque buildings which were designed by Sir Christopher Wren in the late 17th century. So, um, really beautiful, really stunning, but um, you can just imagine how difficult it is to support a modern IT environment on that campus and get good Wi-Fi. Um, so uh, we then have our recently renovated Midway campus, uh, which is in the heart of Chatham uh, and a beautiful uh, red brick Edwardian site. Uh, and last but not least, we have our Elton campus, um, which sits on a, one end of a really nice park in Avery Hill uh, and is currently undergoing a, a multi-year, multi-phase renovation project, uh, which, which will introduce a brand new library and brand new teaching and learning spaces. Um, so uh, I'm sure a lot of you have, may or may not have visited Greenwich before. Um, it's a really wonderful place, uh, really popular tourists. People come from all over to see the, uh, the Cutty Sark or the Prime Meridian or the famous Painted Hall, uh, but equally really popular um, with, the, with the movie makers. Uh, and here are just a, a handful of movies which have been filmed at Greenwich over the years. Um, they're currently filming Cruella de Vil. That's, uh, that's, that's going on at the moment. Uh, so it is a pain getting around campus when they're filming, a real pain, so always late for meetings, um, but it is always a delight to actually uh, walk through campus in the morning or afternoon and see the you know, studios putting their sets up or uh, act, actors rehearsing or actors in costume. So, um, so that's enough about our institution. Here's a, a little bit you know, you know, on our students, which is a more serious note. So, um, as I said in my opening slide, we're a cosmopolitan university. Um, we have a high number, you know, the majority of our students are mature students. Um, we have a high black Asian minority ethnic entry. We're high in non-standard entry qualifications. Uh, and a lot of our students are first, student, uh, first generation students, so first um, you know, students in their family to go to university. Um, and uh, I've mentioned about T&E partnerships, uh, but the salient point to take from this slide is, is obviously know your customers, uh, which is profoundly important uh, in our digital transformation program uh, and important in any digital transformation program in understanding 
uh, where your uh, students or your consumers are uh, in terms of their digital adoption, uh, digital experience, and digital literacy skills. Um, and now I'm going to pass you over to Raina, who's going to talk a little bit more about how we got to know our customers. Okay. Can you flip? Thank you. So how do we know our customers? Well, we run the library, so we're surrounded by students and have constant interaction with them. We're embedded in academic governance. We have ILS representation on Academic Council, the Academic Planning Committee, the Student Experience Committee, and the Learning Quality and Standards Committee. We take a leadership role in academic quality, so, um, and we've chaired quality assurance events. So recently, our director of ILS went to Vietnam, where he's part of a review of one of the international colleges there. We're embedded in the Students' Union. Our ILS director sits on the Students' Union board. And we have students embedded in our projects. So we've recently just revamped our mobile app, and uh, we had a governance board was put in place to, to, do, to manage that, and it was co-chaired by the Students' Union. We also involved students in that project to help prioritise uh, some of the requirements there. For us, feedback and measurement is everything. We take a proactive approach in reviewing and assessing the NSS scores, and we use other methods to gain feedback from our students, so we have those smiley, happy kiosks in our libraries as well. We're also close to the VC, and we're now seen as a trusted partner that IT can be seen to deliver and actually add value to the organisation. So, a little bit more now around the digital strategy development itself. It's important that it's seen as not an IT plan from the IT department. It's actually part of the university strategy. It's not about IT capability. It's the digital contribution to the university. And it, during the, for the development of the plan, it actually involves significant consultation. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that consultation was. So we ran a series of workshops, not just ILS, but we had non-ILS staff as well. And this involved um, what we called a world cafe approach that was taken. We had sessions, tables, people could move between those tables, talk about what they thought were the challenges facing, um, for how, facing us implementing a digital strategy. What were the barriers? What were the opportunities there? And they're very open, no rules. And, uh, and so from that, we had some really consistent messages that were coming out of it. We also took feedback from the Idea Centre. So the VC had actually set up an Idea Centre to get feedback on the strategic plan. And again, we were getting consistent messages from that to feed into the digital strategy. So we had other things we did to get feedback. We had programme leader sessions, talked to other HEs, got feedback from Gartner, looked at other strategies, took steer from other strategies, and there were lots of one-to-one -one sessions held with top management. And so what is, as part of the development of the plan, um, then it was also reviewed by different people. So there was a review process where the plans were shared. What, there were one-to-ones with the VC, with the provost, with the coup, with the finance director. And it went through all these different various um, other committees and boards where finally we got government um, approval in May this year. Thanks, Raina. Um, so, um, so this is our very visual and, and captivating two-page digital strategy covering 2019 to 2022. So a very different look and feel to what um, most IT people are, are, are used to. Um, so this strategy was put together by our Director of Information Library Services, Paul Butler, um, and uh, our former Head of Project Management Office, Dave Mooty, who now works for Illusion, was quite involved in the early development of this. So he is here, he's, he ha he's on a stand, so I'm not sure if he's in this room, um, but I was going to ask you to direct any questions at him. Um, <laughs> but, um, so it, I don't think he's in this room, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so, so we'll get stuck into this. So we'll start with a, with a centrepiece on the first page of this strategy, which is, which is titled Our Digital Journey. Um, so although uh, our digital journey was started in 2013, so although this strategy covers uh, uh, the 19 to, 20, 19 to 2022 period, this actually forms part of a, a 10, 11 year programme of work uh, which began in 2013 uh, with the introduction of our first ever 
uh, tech-driven information technology strategy. Uh, and that was, that was deliberately called an IT strategy because there was a lot of foundational work that had to be done there. Um, so you can see the grey area as it transitions to the, into the coloured area. The grey areas are our, our five-year IT strategy. The coloured areas is, is what we aim to achieve in this digital strategy. So this is not a reset. Uh, there's no hard stop here. This is a continuation on from one strategy to another. Um, so, so a little bit about our IT strategy first. Um, so back in 2013, we had no IT governance. There was no IT governance at all. There was no senior oversight or no decision-making process around how IT investments were governed or overseen or prioritised there. Um, we had no project management office. Um, so we had a few people doing this sort of role, uh, a few business analysts, uh, but nothing substantive in that space. Uh, we had a very inconsistent IT service delivery environment. It was more of a, more of a call centre which, where they would receive calls and redirect calls. Um, uh, and and, and first-time fixed rates were around 35%. From an infrastructure perspective, it was quite old-fashioned. We had around 600-plus uh, physical servers, um, a very flat and sprawling network, very little segregation, uh, very little visibility of what's on the network, um, no real governance or transparency around change, uh, and security wasn't great. And largely, it was, a, it was quite a diverse um, infrastructure and, and technology environment there. Um, and, uh, and also uh, budgets, there was no capital planning there, budgets came in peaks and troughs uh, and lastly the organisational model uh, was a little bit old fashioned uh, and we're really missing some important skills there. Um, so the first, the first strategy, the five year strategy was all about creating uh, that foundational environment, uh, that platform for the future on which we can build digital capabilities uh, and that is, that's all in place now, so that's all done, I finished around 2018. Um, and, and that's all in place. Um, so now um, we have a fully embedded governance model. Um, we have an IT strategy board, various committees reporting to the strategy board, and this is a, uh, a representative decision-making board, um, which is chaired by a deputy vice chancellor, <coughs> has our chief operating officer on, their, on there, all the directors, all the senior academic staff, including our pro vice chancellors, uh, and it has student union representation as well. And so it's pretty much. The IT strategy board pretty much consists of the entire senior management team of the university minus the vice chancellor. Uh, and this, this board reports into our vice chancellor's group. Um, we now have a very mature and capable project management office, which is headed up by Rainer here. Uh, this consists of around uh, 13 to 15 FTE, a combination of project managers and business analysts. Uh, and, and very little enhancement activity goes on, uh, which, either on this strategy, which is driven by the centre, or, or any IT involvement around the university without oversight uh, or direct involvement by the project management office. And they play a real, real vital role um, in ensuring that all the planning work um, behind this strategy goes on, uh, you know, sticks to the plan and, and, and all the benefits are realised. Is that, is that good? Is that good? Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, from an infrastructure perspective, uh, it's completely unrecognisable. Those 600 physical servers are now down, down to about a dozen servers. We've hugely consolidated, hugely standardised. Uh, we're about 95% virtualised, um, running about 12, 1,300 virtual machines. Um, security is in the heart of everything we do. We've got really good best-of-breed firewalls, really good tier, a tiered network, really good seg segregation in place, good governance and transparency around change. Uh, and we've invested a lot of time, in, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of resource and money into this area to ensure that th those core functions of IT, your network and data and telephony, those big systems of, of record, you know, the, those mode one systems, your student record systems, your banners and your finances and HRs, all are all just work, are predictable, secure and reliable. And that's key in ensuring that obviously we could then focus our resources uh, on the more value-added work. Um, so, um, so, so uh, something which isn't, isn't that tangible and, and, and this, this, this doesn't demonstrate clearly is that in the process of, of, of delivering that five-year strategy, um, IT over that period became a lot more professional. Uh, it became more cost-effective, uh, more reliable. But most importantly, it became, it became trusted um, with a proven track record there, as, as Raina said. Of, of leading and delivering on some really high impactful change um, and, and Raina may pick out a few of those in the grey area shortly. Um, so there's no doubt over, the, over those five years 
um, there's, a, there's a trust relationship that was built up there between IT and the senior management team of the university that wasn't there before. Uh, and at a transformation level, um, the business now really do understand uh, that IT is not just about IT. IT is something that the business absolutely have to own and participate in for it to be effective. Uh, and they absolutely get that now. Uh, and they also, and, and the senior management team and the university also understand that digital has to be in everything we do. It's not just about IT. Whether it's finance to support OPEX budgets to effectively leverage a cloud, or whether it's estates to create new flexible digital collaboration spaces, or HR to create uh, and, and develop contracts and CPDs around the continued development and support of digital literacy, or the library to create training sessions and networking sessions around digital. It has to be in everything we do for it to be successful if we really want to get to those levels of innovation and cultural change required for our university to really become digital. So there's, there's a, a lot of work um, that's been done there. Um, and largely, this, this document is a marketing tool to articulate a vision. So we felt it was really important to not only demonstrate what we, or, or show what we want to achieve, um, but also what we have achieved. Very proud about what we've achieved. Um, we want anyone to be able to pick up this two-page document and really uh, resonate it, it for it to resonate with them, for them to understand it. There's no technical jargon in this strategy. There's no verbose narrative. It's colourful. Um, it, it's a, it's a two-page document. It's punchy. It's to the point. And that's really important. Um, so uh, that was a bit, a bit about our 5 year strategy. This digital strategy is no longer about the tech at all. It's, it's profoundly more. This is about improving outcomes. It's about the people, the processes, experience, and what people touch and feel. And the themes which are, are directly lifted from our university strategic plan uh, reflect that. Um, and I'll pass you over to Raina, who's going to talk a bit more about the themes, a bit about our driving principles, and that will segue us nicely into the second page of the strategy. OK. So um, this first page is really about what we're going to be doing and when. Um, it directly lifts on the top right-hand corner, um, it, or your left, um, it directly lifts um, the first three objectives from the university strategic plan, and it just adds one additional objective, um, which is enhancing the digital environment. These are colour-coded throughout the whole strategy, so you can see how things link together. Um, and uh, along the top, it talks about our themes as well. And these are about developing our people, enhancing processes, excellent student experiences, and facilitating effective research. Then you have the plan in the middle, so the grey bits, which remember it's just spoken about, are all the things that we've achieved. And the colour coding are, are the, the um, main strategic projects that we see we need to deliver to support the digital strategy and how they tie back. And along the bottom, it talks about some of the driving principles that underline this strategy. And I'm going to talk just a little bit more about these, because I think from an IT perspective, these are definitely ones that have resonated with myself. So the first principle that I'm going to talk about is um, called We Are One University. We will operate as one university, ensuring our processes and methods are simple and universally applied. So as you remember, I talked about the Idea Centre um, earlier that the VC had created. And one of the things that came out of there was the issues around lack of consistency around processes. So um, based on that feedback, the COO actually created an initiative called One University. And this was all about getting consistency on processes. It wasn't about the IT. Um, and I've really seen a culture change when I've been going to project meetings since this initiative has started. So one of them, for example, was when we were looking at our extenuating circumstances. At one point, we had five systems and five processes. This project brought them together, and we now have one process and one system. So that's really the underlying. We, that's what we're aiming to do, and only be different when we need to be different. Another example is we're currently doing an assessment misconduct system. So again, where there were different systems and different processes out there, we're now coming to one process and one system. And we recently, we had an on-premise environment for the, share, um, for the business school, an on-premise SharePoint environment, which they actually use for their assessment moderation. But as we worked with them to move them to the cloud, we identified SharePoint wasn't the best place for them to, um, to do the assessment moderation. And we developed a system for them. But we made sure we were speaking to the other faculties at that point and making sure that whatever we developed for the business school, they could use that system. And we expect next year to be transitioning over to them as well. 
So another one of the um, principles is around product first. We will make use of commercial products and services by default and only develop internally where there is no other viable option. Again, this is really helpful, I think, from an IT perspective. In the past, um, someone, a fa faculty or directorate might have automatically come to us, can you develop us a new system? Now, knowing we have the support, you know, from the support perspective, from the strategy, we'll look outside, is there a product that can do this? That, and we'll also look internally, can we kind of sweat some of our existing systems? Can it provide functionality that no one knew about? So one of the um, completed um, blocks on there that will be in grey will be the employability passport. So a little while ago, each faculty um, had their own system, their own process for doing the employability passport, but they were all saying it wasn't fit for purpose. So we looked out there, was there a product out there, spoke to other universities, and then looked internally and actually saw one of our existing systems, Career Hub. We could actually just do some small-scale developments, and that um, could then be used by all the faculties doing one process. Um, and that's now being used consistently across the university. So the last principle I was going to talk about was um, cloud first. Cloud products and services will be selected by default to gain benefits of scalability and as-is service. So we're currently moving our on-premise HR environment to the cloud. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we've recently moved our SharePoint environment from on-premise onto the cloud. So that, re that really wraps up uh, the, the first page. And I'm now just going to uh, go on to the um, second page of the strategy. So this, this is all about outcomes and capabilities. Um, so it talks about there, about how will we know if we've succeeded. One, to supporting and developing our staff, it states, staff are able to effectively communicate, collaborate and work from anywhere, anytime. It also talks about KPIs, so how are we going to measure us and know that we're going to be successful and we're refining these over time. And in the middle, under KPIs, it talks about resources and people and our budget. So we have set budgets. So from a PMO perspective, from a project's perspective, we, um, we have a set budget each year, which has actually increased over the years, that we know what we have to, um, to help plan the project. So that gives us our long um, forecasting to help us. And it also talks there about the capital budget, budget and also um, our academic rolling programme. So we know that what budget and what money we have and the resources we have um, there to use. Thanks, Raina. Um, so, um, so Raina spoke there about, um, you know, capabilities, about success factors and resources. And, and those, those capabilities on the left there are things that we, we expect to deliver between now, now and 2022. Um, but this section on the right here, um, uh, target stakeholder experiences, is our way of articulating at a story level what life looks and feels like for different stakeholders uh, around the university in 2022. So what life looks and feels like for a student, for a researcher, for an academic, uh, and for a senior decision maker in 2022. So from a student perspective, um, what, what would life look like for a student applying for university in 2022? Uh, what, is it, what would life be like for a student um, trying to navigate various digital learning resources and understanding how to curate and apply those to their studies? Um, what is it like for a student trying to access learning resources and subject-specific software? Um, so I, I won't read all of this, but I'll just read the first part of the student just to try and bring this to life. And it's a bit blurry, so um, I hopefully I don't mis misread it here. So um, when I applied to the University of Greenwich, uh, I felt valued as an individual uh, as a result of receiving communications and information which really gave me a sense of what I should expect as a student within the Greenwich community. As a learner, there are tools and services which enable me to participate in my learning environment where and when it's convenient for me. The subject-specific software I need to use is convenient and available remotely, which has enabled me to succeed despite having a range of personal commitments. Blah, blah, blah. So, um, so it talks there about the individual. Uh, it's about an individual experience, a learning, teaching, collaborative environment that works for that individual around their commitments and around their responsibilities. So, um, you know, so in, in 2022, uh, we can take a look back at this and say, have we been true to our, our principles? Have we been true? You know, ha have we made, for example, the ecosystem for academics as easy to use and simple as possible? 
you know, have we, ha have we stopped them having to enter grades into two, three different systems and all the other administrative processes they have to follow, which would really give them time back. So, and, and there's a similar story there for researchers and, and other senior decision makers. So that is largely about the stakeholder uh, and making sure that their world is improved over the, over the next um, four years. So uh, a little bit about Education 4.0. Um, so I'm sure some of you or a lot of you will, may have seen the work that JISC have done around Education 4.0, which is all about rethinking how we educate our students uh, and an opportunity as this fourth industrial revolution kicks off to really think about uh, what a modern educational environment looks like. Um, so, um, and, and just talk uh, a lot in their reports and surveys around a nexus of trends driving this around AI, robotics, big data, um, internet of things, augmented and virtual reality. And, and there's no doubt um, that in the future, all of those or a combination of those will play an important role in education moving forward. Um, uh, so, you know, right now, um, so I'm just checking, checking my notes here. Um, so, so right now, um, a student um, may not be looking uh, at an institution to see how digitally capable, are, capable they are. Largely, they're picking uh, their institution based on what course and what modules and whether the campus is nice. But it's not insurmountable to think that in the future, a student, possibly in the next three to five years, a student will look at what it, how digitally capable and what digital services the institution does provide and pick based on that. Can I access my lectures and can I get access to my um, lecturers and, and, and tutorials without having to go to campus? So the question, and, and largely, um, the world, it's about appreciating that the world around us is changing. Um, the way people engage with the world is changing. Um, students and staff alike, especially those brought up in the digital age, do interact with the world in a completely different way. Whether that be socially or professionally, they interact with the world through a digital lens. Um, they have their heads in their phones or heads in other devices, and they're used to consuming services at a press of a button from wherever they are, from you know, however they want and whenever they want. So it's about, as a university, asking ourselves the question, how do we, how do we engage with these types of people? Uh, what are their expectations? And how do we appropriately include digital into their educational experience? Um, and, and, and it's also about how do we most effectively educate our students? Um, you know, teaching uh, and learning has largely been done the same way for hundreds of years in, in lecture halls. Uh, it's about understanding how digital and technology can help lecturers and, and, and students um, learn more effectively for, uh, in a way that works for them and give the time back to the lecturers and, and students for those to have those meaningful one-to-one -one mentoring sessions and contact hours. Um, and, and just a note, a note to finish on, um, obviously, we, we, we don't need a crystal ball to tell us that there will be a disruptor in the HE sector moving forward. Um, there are lots of pressures and trends going on, and just got a few listed here, you know, Brexit, tuition fees, uh, you know, the Orga review, the demographic dip, you know, left students in the system, uh, MOOCs and the rise, rise of other online, on, online uh, education, you know, really challenge, challenging that normal university brick and mortar approach to teaching. Uh, and although we may have a good idea of what disruptors may look like, what they may be, um, it's largely unknown. So, uh, but when that does come, I guess the question we'll ask ourselves as a university is, you know, have we created a digitally uh, confident and resilient workforce? Uh, and are our systems and processes flexible and adaptable so that we can confront whatever's next, as we don't want to be the next Blockbuster or Kodak? Um, so that covers all the key elements of the strategy, and um, Raina will just wrap this up. So, um, so as I said earlier, the, the strategy was signed off in May this year. Um, success has followed. We've uh, won the um, teaching award, student-led teaching award again this year, having won it last year. We have the highest engagement uh, within ILS across the university, and um, our NSS results for learning resources um, has improved, which it has done year on year. So as Mehmet George, um, said earlier, we're, we're really proud um, of the work that we've done so far. So talking about um, how we're going to actually implement this. So um, one of the things we've done is we've is initiated a digital skills capabilities project. Um, and we have amalgamated the digital skills with the academic skills, which actually um, is run by the library, which is within ILS. 
So one of the tangible examples of this is that every new student now will um, have to do a Moodle course called um, Level Up. Um, and part of that really is how do a student understanding how to be a student at the University of Greenwich, how to navigate the library, how to use digital discovery, and how to curate information. So that's a key element of how we see moving forward with our strategy. We've built, built the key principles into our IT governance, and we're ensuring that our IT governance continues to provide the strategic, um, to support the key strategic projects. And we also continued alignment of IT to support the strategy. We can't stop still. So recently within my team, we've created a change manager role. Um, and also we've created um, a digital strategy and enterprise architect lead role, which reports directly into the director. So they're the main elements now um, that we want to talk about. And so we've pretty much wrapped it up, come to the end of our time. Um, if you wanted a link to the strategy, I've put, it, um, put the link on there. And I've also put our email addresses um, if you'd like to ask us any questions. Or uh, Obviously, we're, we're around uh, the next couple of days if you want to approach us directly as well. And so, any questions? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just curious how you um, integrated your 47 partners into all of this that you said you had around the world and the 18,000 students that you've got in there and what role they played in all of this and uh, how they're going to uh, be affected by this. So you, you mentioned you had 47 partners and, and 18,000 students around the world and a lot of what you're talking about is, is obviously at Greenwich and stuff like that. So how have they been incorporated into this um, considering they've probably got their own IT infrastructures in there? in their host institutions. So how are those students going to benefit from, um, from your digital strategy? I mean, at, at the moment, I can just talk about some of the tangible ways that we're moving forward um, on this. So uh, Greenwich, I think, is one of the largest T&E um, universities. Um, the business school, which I talked about earlier, um, around more around, I suppose, the back end side of things, around the administration side of things around how we actually work with our um, partners. We've just actually had a colleague who worked with us as, um, on the project. We're moving our on-premise onto the cloud. Um, as I said, it's more focused around our um, in involvement with the T&E partners. Is beforehand, when a review had happened out, um, for example, in SEGI, um, there was quite a lot of feedback to say that the partners were struggling with our systems, they were all working differently, um, and there was a lot of negative feedback around that. Um, as part of the move where we've done uh, SharePoint onto the, on pre, um, into the cloud, we tried to streamline that and make that a lot better. And the colleague has just returned back and saying that from that perspective, they're, um, they're a lot happier um, and that's going to be working a lot better. And we're also now starting to work with uh, other departments around the T&E internally. So that's one way on that. With regards to um, the students, I don't think from a Greenwich perspective we separate them or see them any um, kind of any differently. And I think what, we're, what we'll try and do for some respects is whatever we're trying to look at internally, we'll have to try and understand how we can work with that from a, from a T&E perspective. Hi. Um, so, you had a strategy, from what I understood, and I may have got this wrong, from 2013 to 2018 seems to be quite um, getting your platforms right, getting your processes right, getting the technology right. And that is, you know, it seems to lend itself very much to the kind of project model, and that, that works quite well. But that's five years, a lot changes in five years. So. When you were engaging those the, the student groups and the, 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 the different stakeholders, was that done in 2013, and, or, and was it done again in 2018? And is that something that's ongoing all the time? Uh, you, you know, because these things don't stay still, do they? Uh, it, you know, things are changing, as you said, all the time. So, and what we've noticed at our institution is that, you know, from year to year, students have a different view. And, and what they want from technology and digital and what their idea of digital is. Sorry, long question, but it, is that being reviewed and updated continually? And the other thing is, for the next, for your next, you know, you're implementing the, the innovative stuff, is the project model really the right model? 
I suppose on one point, talking about the strategy, I think this is why Paul really wanted it when he was designing it to be an, a two-pager. Um, so it wasn't like, oh, here's a document, I've written that, put that away in the cupboard. You, you'll see this when you go around our, uh, specifically, I suppose, our ILS department where we work. It's pinned up. It's pinned up in his room. It's pinned up in, in other areas in everyone's room or along the corridor so that people can keep seeing it and keep finding it. I definitely don't think it's something that we've done and we've put away. As I said earlier, we're looking at the KPIs. KPIs have been put on there. It's not the ones that are set in stone. We'll keep refining them, and we'll keep, do, we'll keep doing, doing that. Um, whether, um, uh, you know, whether we actually get another document in a year's time, say, oh, this is where we've updated it, and this is how we're going. But we, we definitely, it's not something that's there and that is put away and forgot, forgotten about. So that is definitely, from a cultural point of view, that's how we see it, and that'll be how we work, work with it. And constantly looking at what are the barriers from stopping us. So from a senior management perspective, we're saying, so we've got to deliver this. What barriers are in there, you know, that are stopping us from being able to deliver this? And, what are we, and we'll have to keep refining those and working on, on those from that perspective. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and just to add, um, uh, I mean, that's absolutely right what Raina said. And, and the first strategy was, was more of an inwards-looking process. Um, so that, that was about looking inwards, taking a close look at operations within, within IT, going to understand those costs, standardising those processes, introducing things like ITIL, trying to standardise technology platforms, getting rid of legacy stuff, trying to modernise and become and put in the right capabilities so that we can be agile and, 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 and flexible uh, in that. And, and I think these days we, we work with, uh, I mean, we started to work heavily with product teams. And, yeah, I was going to say um, about the product group. So the other thing about the IT governance, every year... Um, we review the IT governance model, we have an IT strategy at the top, and then we have various boards and committees under it. And what we're starting to see now, um, probably people in the room have heard about it, Gartner seems to be pushing it quite a lot, is about product groups. So I talked about SharePoint earlier, we've now got a SharePoint product group. Um, I talked about Career Hub, actually, is one of the things we've used in employability. We had, um, we had our uh, SAS team, our, our, our student academic system uh, team, um, and then we had another area within the business that were using it, and then we had IT that really, we just kept the server on and we kept it like... And actually, these cross teams, it wasn't working. So actually, what I suggested is, let's have a product group, let's do a terms of reference, let's see whether this model will work, and it's brought people together to actually understand why are they here, what are we trying to do, what's the strategic direction? And I think maybe that's what you're saying is a project comes in, it finishes, and actually, I think what we're seeing now is these product groups, it, it is continual. Um, so we, we and we've just set one up for a banner as well, a banner, our main student yeah. record system. Yeah, because 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 you know in the past we take on a new service, you know it goes into into my area, you know into ops and and you know we water and feed it, we try and keep it alive, but no one really drives it, champions it, moves it forward. So we're hoping these these product groups, like Raina said, they're ongoing, they're continuous. It's not just IT people. IT people don't actually chair any boards or committees anymore. And that's something our, our directors kind of put in. You know, it's putting the owners back on the business uh, to really try and drive their products and justify why they need them. And, and us there from an IT perspective to try and support them in their strategic, what are you trying to do, where are you trying to get to? So, yeah, that's, that's where we're, we're, we're yeah. trying with the product so, groups. So, so, long question, long answer. So, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. A linking question. The change within the ICT yeah. function, more importantly, the ICT mindset, I think you've actually started to comment on it. You might just extend a little bit further. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, can you... Did you, did you no, I sorry, didn't. It was a little, sorry. Bit, a little bit light, sorry. Sorry, the ICT mindset, the aptitudes, the attitudes, the behaviours of ICT, I th the last part of your uh, discussion with the gentleman across the way went into that territory. Could you expand a little bit further, please? I remember quite what I said on there. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm afraid um, uh, ab yeah. about the, the mindset. It, was there particularly... Sorry, could you re-say what I said and then I can try and build okay. it? Uh, that's <laughs> all right. That's okay. You mentioned just, just to, 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 as, as the last uh, uh, contributor uh, mentioned, you're coming off a five-year plan, which was about foundational elements. You now are moving into the exploitation level, if I could summarize it that way. 
Uh, the nature of your ICT department, I think I'm picking up, that has changed. Uh, and not just your department uh, in, in, in the organizational sense, but in your skill sets, your mindsets, your approach, your behaviors. Um, and perhaps it's in that space that the real key for us moving forward is. So, uh, just wondering, could you comment a little bit further on that? So, um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. We're, we are in the midst of, 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 of some serious transformation going on here. Um, and it, it is a completely different mindset. And, and I'll talk a little bit about, I guess, my area in, in infrastructure. Obviously, we, we, know, we've all, uh, we know a lot about the cloud now. You know, we, we know that that's... Uh, fun fundamentally different to what we're used to doing and the way we're used to managing services. And that does require, in its own right, a different, a different mindset, a different way of working. Um, but at, at a university level, as I said, IT are now a strategic partner to, the, uh, you know, a strategic partner ally to the university. We work with the businesses. No, we don't work, you know, in the basement anymore, just spinning up whatever we want to do. This is something that is all driven now by the by the business. Um, and it is a cultural mindset. Bringing in a project management office uh, and governance is a completely different um, mindset. Um, yeah. so, so there is a lot going on, and I guess it's a transition. And, and I think some of that is that... So I joined five years ago. Um, I previously worked at PwC for about 13 years in this area. And so going from a private to a public... Um, and also, I was told when I came in, you know, go softly, get it, get it in, don't start, you know, say this template, this process, it, it was going to fail. So I think over the last five years, from a project management perspective, we've, we've built up that we can deliver and that show it by your results. You, you know, don't project manage people to death, for example, just show them and help them, show that you're adding value. And as you start delivering and start bringing people um, with you, and actually even like people in Memet team, show that we're adding value, that we're not actually being a blocker from a project management perspective. And actually now I do feel from even five years ago, um, people, teams are working a lot more together, people are collaborating more together, and so it is that cultural shift. But I suppose it has to come from the top. Um, and that's definitely something that I'd say from our director, that, that's where this, this strategy was hit, you know, he created this, it had input from, you know, from lots of different areas, but this is where it's not just from um, the, you know, VCO level, but he's driving that, and that's the culture then that comes down to the senior management team, and that's what then we try and spread out across um, the different teams as well, and I suppose from a cultural change, that's where it's got to be bottomed out and top up as well. I really liked your um, description of your level up um, module for your students and I thought it was really great to improve their sort of digital capabilities. I suppose the slightly uh, controversial thing to ask is would you ever think about rolling it out to your professional services staff and academics? Well, we're actually, um, some of you, not that one, but some of you may be aware of JISC of a digital capabilities tool. Um, so we've actually purchased that. We're looking, so as talking earlier, I've got a change manager in my team, working closely with the library, and we're actually looking at that tool um, to see as a way of um, how we can assist and support um, the academic community as well on that. So that is definitely something that's as part of the plan. How we will do that and get traction, that's one of the challenges. It's one of the challenges that you have on any prep project to get traction in that area. And that's where my challenge back is how can we try and do something a little bit different? If we know things don't work in the past, what can we do to do a little bit differently? And they're the kind of discussions that we're having internally. So yes, there is definitely a focus that we're doing and um, looking at that for staff as well. Thank you very much.